I was muted. Uh, can you hear me now, guys? I hope you can hear me now, guys. So um, welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova, and uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to be with you today. I don't know what I would do with you guys, without you guys, because um, I might have, if, uh, some of you didn't speak up. I might have done this whole show with my microphone muted. So thank you. I had uh, begun the stream partly just to fill some time with this uh, time-lapse photography of flowers. Uh, the feedback has been very good that uh, it's amazing and beautiful. And I think maybe it's a good way to just start off because <clears throat> maybe uh, – we're going to go into some kind of boring material. I did invite some people through emails if they would like to join the stream just to uh, just to talk and ask questions. But in lieu of that, uh, I'm going to try to monitor the chat. So if you have questions um, and you can type them in that short space that they allow, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to do my best to answer. Um, so greetings, Terry. We haven't, it's nice to see you again. Uh, so, so what? Well, um, part of what I had shown in this, um, um, with this opening video, Jesus said, consider the lilies of the valley, how they, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. Jesus, this is actually Jesus' encouragement to us. Um, um, in his image uh, offered, sorry, I can't type and read <laughs> and monitor at the same time. Uh, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send you an, um, an email, Emery. Just give me a moment. And thank you. I, I sent emails to other people partly to give Emory a break because he's a graduate student in biology. And, oh, one cow stampede is here. Great to see you. One cow stampede. I'll call you Aaron. Thank you for joining us. Uh, how's your microphone? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So it's great because now if you have questions and you're the you're the guy that really likes structural biology, um, oh, yeah. this will be great. So I was saying the reason I showed that video, the time lapse photography, uh, there, the first verse that comes to mind is that verse where Jesus was encouraging people if they have anxiety. He said, uh, "Consider the lilies of the valley." So this is very interesting. People are having all sorts of problems in their life. And just the daily, the daily difficulties of living in a fallen world. And what does he say? Consider the lilies of the valley, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And uh, the process of studying God's creation, not just the lilies of the valley, but um, uh, all, all things in creation, 
at all levels from the molecular at the you know a, even atomic interactions and then molecular interactions and then the higher levels of organization um the higher levels of organization we see god's glory it comforts us that there's an all-wise um designer so not only does it assure us uh <laughs> Not only does it give us ammunition to just blow away the evolutionists, um, it 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 is a source of comfort to us. So even if there were no evolutionists, and let's say we were living in a mostly creationist world, we'd probably still have problems to to overcome and be comforted from. So let's say you're in a in a community of creationists, you're still going to have challenges in the world. And Jesus is saying to consider the lilies of the valley. Um, it was just by accident that I grabbed that video because I just wanted to throw something out there. And I realized this is perfect way of introducing this topic on protein biology. So you get to see it from kind of what I call the high level. You know, just the flowers in all their glory. But now we're going to go down to the molecular level. Um, we're gonna um, we're gonna see a little piece of all the machinery that has to be built to make that beauty. So <laughs> it's almost unfortunate I began with something so uh, visually impactful and beautiful and just enthralling. Uh, now we're gonna go down to the molecular details. And I tell you when I was studying biochemistry, after about the first seven minutes, I was about ready to go to sleep. Not because I, um, I didn't reverence the process of learning, but it was, it was really difficult stuff. It was like memorizing a phone book. Now, the other verse that comes to mind when you, especially seeing that time lapse full, uh, photography, and you could see the flowers as they develop. It says, um, "To the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day." Uh, the time-lapse photography gives you a picture of how the Lord sees things. And I, I hope that was compelling because when you see um, when you see it speeded up, it's like that's also God's perspective. He could see it in slow motion and in fast motion. We saw it in fast motion. You begin to see the marvel of the Creator in a different way when you can also see things um, from different perspective, perspectives like that. So the, um, the modern day tools that God has provided us through the gift of science is, science is helping us understand his glorious creation. So with that said, I'm gonna greet, try to greet people here. Um, there, are about, uh, there are up to 20 viewers earlier and now we've uh, gone down to 11. And uh, uh, so I'm just gonna acknowledge people, Mr. Jetty, Jamie Russell, in his image, also known as Emery Moina, and I'm going to send him a, a email. Patrick Alexander, Raman, Yoiza <laughs> Dango, Erica Hubner, One Cow Stampede, who's here, Honesty Angel, and uh, Terry Tannett, Godzilla Freak. Great to see you all. If I missed someone, apologies in advance. So, I, um, Andrew, welcome. Uh, this is the second stream, the real Andrew Kaufman. God bless you, sir. Uh, it's a little choppy. Sometimes it, it, uh, the choppiness happens um, because of uh, the computer. But um, still, thank you for com um, coming to the show. Uh, try again. Yeah, um, is this better? I, I don't know if you hear me, but uh, I have problems with my internet here. Uh, I might have to drop out and, and keep up with the chat. Um, the audio is very choppy. I couldn't understand a thing you said. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I don't know what's going on. One cow, why don't you try your microphone? Yeah, see if mine's any better. Does that work? Yes. Um, if you talk for a few minutes, because I can't type and talk, I'm going to send Emery Moina a invitation.
to join okay. the stream. And Andrew, brother, um, I wanted to tell you I was thinking of you today and praying for you. And uh, <laughs> no, Sal, what you're doing, this is this is something that I, I don't even think, you know, we would have dreamed of. And, you know, having having access to the kind of teaching um, just for regular lay people like myself and and uh, I don't know, it's, it's just phenomenal finding all this stuff on, on YouTube, finding you guys on Reddit. Um, I mean. I don't know. I'm 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 a little older. I'm gosh, I'm 38. So I remember, you know, <laughs> life before the internet, which is kind of kind of an age thing to say. But it, it's just awesome, you know, being able to ask questions to a PhD geologist about, you know, about the flood, which is just something you could not do. Uh, it's I'm I'm glad this is around. I hope it sticks around for a while. It's kind of anyone's guess as to, you know, how long before, you know, things get shut down by the powers that be. But I think in the meantime, uh, we should, you know, take these opportunities to, to learn what we can and strengthen our faith. And uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Well, thank you for the kind words. And I'm still typing a um, information for our friend Emery. Uh, so if you can forbear sure. with me, uh, why don't you, uh, if you want to introduce a little bit more of uh, who you are or how we encountered each oh, other. Yeah. Now, you're the guy who really likes um, audiobooks, right? Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I'm a, I'm an audio learner. I don't know. I, I always seem to have a stack of books to read, you know, actual old school, um, you know, bound paper books to read, but you can only get through so many of those, especially if, you know, when life starts throwing stuff at you. But the audio, I think a lot of people, you know, get stuff from podcasts. And uh, I think I think the book format just seems to have something. It makes people really think about how they want to phrase things. You know, they... It, in a podcast, you're just kind of flying off the cuff, but when you're writing something out, you, you really have the time to, to go back, relook at it, make sure you have it say exactly what you want to say. And so I think that's just a, it's almost a more concentrated form of thought. And I think that for some reason that just, I don't know, that speaks to me more than, um, than the less formal stuff and kind of a weird guy. So that's probably not for anyone, everyone, but uh, no, it's, um, yeah, it, it really kind of changed things for me, I guess. Um, I just sort of dove in and tried to stay ahead of my curiosity. So if something piqued my interest. I just kind of wanted to see what would happen if I just didn't starve it at all. Just kept feeding it if it was, uh, you know still on the topic and then it really pulled me into the creation evolution debate and there was a, just a, a a fair amount of the discovery institute authors were on audible um so douglas axe and um god i just finished uh, the god hypothesis with stephen meyer michael behe and Michael Denton, I think, was probably my favorite by far, the uh, evolution, the theory, and crisis. I think I read that like seven times, just kept going over it until it, you know, until it stuck. But a lot of those things really started to solidify in my head, and it was easier to, to follow the conversations of people like yourself and some others on Reddit who really held their own against uh, <laughs> the debate evolution crowd. Uh and I think my whole goal was just I wanted to be able to follow the conversation because I think before you wrap your head around some of this stuff, all you have to go off of is a person's demeanor because you're, if you're watching, you know, two experts argue, you really don't know, you know, if one could be distorting the truth or not. And so you really look at how they're interacting with other people and, you know, kind of what their temperament is. 
And that's something I think you are an exemplar of, uh, that you're, you're <laughs> you got a lot of, uh, uh, you exemplify what the Bible talks about with, you know, correcting people with gentleness and, and, uh, just kind of showing love, even when you disagree, even when it's, you know, heated disagreement, you don't kind of lose yourself. Yeah. I don't know. That's, I'm proud of you. I, I think you're doing an awesome thing. So. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for, I just want to thank everyone for j just helping make this a, a community of supporting each other because we live in hard, we do live in challenging times and uh, even in, even in good era, eras of the world in the United States, everyone has their challenges in a, you know, in a fallen world. Andrew, we love you, brother. And um, sorry, you have to be on the sidelines this time, but thanks for trying to join the show. You're on my mind because uh, um, you're exactly the sort of person, like a lot of people here, that may not be biology students like me and Emery. And we really want people to, to understand that verse that consider the lilies of the valley. We want to help them, equip them to understand God's creation kind of through our eyes because uh, and to understand the language. And, and uh, so, Emery, man, I just feel bad imposing on you. You've been such a faithful and frequent visitor here, and I'm just trying to use, uh, I'm trying to call upon you sparingly because I, I know the demands on your life. So thank you for joining us, brother. Uh, it's, it's not a problem, Sal. I, uh, I'm actually like, tonight was a meeting night for grad school, and so like I'm done for the night. I have nothing, no more grad school to do tonight, so I can pop in. I, it really just depends on the night. Like the beginning of the week, if you're, if you're doing stuff on like Monday through Wednesday, you can just forget about me. I'm, <laughs> I'm basically useless. But as we get toward the end of the week, I finish up a lot of stuff that's due for a particular week. And you usually have a little bit more space toward the end of the week. Now that will go away in about a week and a half when finals start. <laughs> but <laughs> until that point where we're, I'll be, I'll be okay. So yeah. Biology finals were never too hard for me. Um, Biostatistics final, so. Oh, yeah, math. <laughs> the physics finals were just gruesome. Um, I'm still traumatized <laughs> uh, by classical <laughs> mechanics. If people say, oh, that's, you know, that's not the most advanced, I'm just like, um, well, it's the foundation. <laughs> and I tell you, Goldstein's mechanics was the most, the way the professor taught it. Uh, it, it was the most miserably difficult class I've ever taken. I was like, oh my goodness, this is almost as hard in a, as an entire undergraduate degree. It was so difficult for me. Um, and uh, part of it was I'd been out of school for a long time when I started studying physics again. So, oh, I really want to thank one Cal Stampede for talking about all the mediums of, of communication the way to maximize our ability to learn is to use all the senses and capabilities. So visual and then reading is very conceptual. And um, it, I'm a very, you know, I like diagrams. Uh, it, it's sometimes hard for me to, to read and then try to connect things in my head. And so it's nice when I have diagrams uh, and then animations. And that's probably true for a lot of people. But then the audio books, um, I myself have been going, trying to go through the Bible four times a year with the audiobooks. Um, I, I love Max McLean's King James Version. <laughs> now, for when I teach, I try to teach in kind of more modern English, so I use the English standard. But I, I've been blessed going through the Bible four times a year, and I'm. This may sound like a mean thing, but. Um, some of the sermons out there are just so bad. I don't waste my time listening to them. I'd rather just listen to the Bible, uh, whatever chapter. And and even in, in places I, I wouldn't expect, I, I start to pick up things like the book of Ezra. Just in, in the listing of all the people, uh, groups, and the counts, um, 
it, it does something for me. So I just wanted to thank you, One Cow Stampede, for pointing that out. To that end, I am trying to write a book. The content will be available for free on the internet for people to listen to me kind of discuss it and and share. But um, there is, you know, I wanted to, there's something about publishing a book. Um, it kind of, I don't know, just the written word just has a little more authority. <laughs> and uh, so I will publish it partly just for that reason. And then um, that might be the only product that might be kind of the products that I would actually sell, even though the content is available for free through the internet. And I'm just going to see if that business model works because uh, some people will watch a talk on the internet and they say, I really want to buy the book. It does something for them. But now that one cow stampede talked about audible books, I think I might try to add that uh, to the repertoire. So to that end, the first book that I'm going to booklet booklet, maybe 30 to 40 pages. It's meant to be easy reading. It's not going to be like my biology and physics stuff. Definitely not like my physics stuff. Um, it's You know your writing is thick when you can't even read what you, you wrote yourself without thinking about it. Some of my math and physics writing is so thick, I'm just like, oh my goodness, I have to sit down and just crawl through it. Um, I, I know that may sound strange, but it's like, yeah, you know, I I'm trying to read the equations and derivations I wrote just also to, to make sure I understand it. And th there've been times I've written these huge mathematical proofs took me two days to put together. It'll be 10 pages long. And I'm just like, um, I don't think I can recapitulate this from memory, even though I authored it. Uh, so what I'm writing is going to be, it's meant to be more accessible. So to that end, I'd like to, um, share with the uh, viewers, in just in case they don't know, um, many of you here tonight have already um, seen it. Um, I'm going to share um, links to my uh, Doubting Thomas. So the first book is going to be Cures for Doubting Thomas. And I'm typing it in now, Doubting Thomas. And uh, Andrew, do you want to test your Mike, one more time uh, while I... Uh, testing, testing. Oh, oh the last God. Time. That's way better. Oh, okay, great. Could have been the... Uh, I bought a microphone from my phone, and I it was cheap, so I borrowed one from my brother. All right, so I, I put the links to my Cures for Doubting Thomas. Actually, I think um, the first one got through, and I'm going to put in the second link because... Uh, our show was interrupted uh, because I had a computer crash today. I'm, I have a backup system, and we'll see if it works. I think that if, as long as someone is in the in the panel discussion, that the stream will continue. I'm going to test that out uh, sometime. I have a I have a second computer, and we'll we'll just see how this works. Yeah, so, so if you want to do that at the end of the stream with me, I can stick around, and you can just crash crash your laptop out, and I'll. Uh sit here and wait and see. Oh, if oh thanks. Thanks. I'm going to probably test it on another channel. Okay. Uh, so, man, it is great to have the panel up and running. Uh, this is um, <laughs> Gavin Erland. Sir, God bless you. What kind words I could listen to Sal read the telephone book. <laughs> <laughs> That's dedication right there. Anybody who can sit and listen to anybody read the telephone book, I don't care who it is. Well, I think that's, that's, a, that's a figure of speech. It's just very kind of him to I say know, that. I know, I know. So um, this is great because I, I specifically wanted people um, with non-biology -bi backgrounds and the kind of people that are able to conceive of the way I'm going to describe proteins today are, are people that are kind of mechanically minded. And I think both Andrew and One Cow Stampede are mechanically minded. They build things. Yeah. Um, either professionally or on the side. So that's great. Yes. Uh, I was a welder and I did mechanic work. So yeah, I've got a background in that. And, and the reason I, it's actually been a little bit of a um, challenge trying to communicate this um, in um, 
you know, there's something in the ID community that's made it difficult for me. They really like specified complexity and information theory, and it's been difficult for me to fight. My background was originally in information theory because I was in computer science and electrical engineering. Your information theory to death. And I've been critical of the ID movement using this. And, and they, you know, on one stream, some people that didn't know any better were saying, you know, pay attention, Sal, you know. And I just like, I have more information theory than all you guys combined. <laughs> I'm criticizing this for a reason because uh, um, I don't think it's been the most effective way to communicate ID. Um, uh, I, I think people were just a little too in, over enthusiastic on the idea of information theory. It's like, yes, biology has information, but it doesn't mean you grab all these information theory books. And I can, I'm really glad a few people have come out and said, yeah, I looked at Sh Shannon's papers and stuff. And it's like, I couldn't see the relevance. It's like exactly my point. I've been through the curriculum. And what I've been trying to say is, um, Let's look at protein probabilities in terms of geometry. Geometry. And the way to see it is if you're kind of like a mechanically minded mechanic or um, what did they call it? Grease monkey. <laughs> it, uh, a plumber or any of these manly man type jobs, which I really do respect, um, uh, especially when I'm trying to fix things around the house. Uh, just like that's the crowd I want to reach to, but then also the physics guys, the mechanical engineers, uh, any of the, this, any of the engineers that do geometry, which ironically electrical engineers like me actually didn't do very much. <laughs> Our stuff is so esoteric. You don't actually do stuff in, uh, uh, unless you're doing electromagnetic theory, but even then that feels kind of esoteric. I wanted to reach out to that crowd. And so it's been hard trying to say, we can understand protein, the problem of protein evolution in terms of geometry. And so that's what we're gonna to try to do today. And um, so I'm just gonna just dump a whole bunch of videos um, that I found on the internet. And uh, we'll just see what resonates with you guys. Now it was I, amazingly how all this was also kind of, um, uh, this inspiration was kind of um, uh, um, given a little bit more fuel to the fire, so to speak, was my interactions with one cow stampede on Reddit. Uh, he was saying, well, are there any audiobooks I can learn about biology? And just like, no, <laughs> no, that's not how you learn it. I said, watch this video, watch structural biology videos and you'll get it. And I was, if you look at some of the old style biochemistry textbooks, didn't have a lot of diagrams. It'll say, okay, you know, this molecule connects to this molecule, this molecule connects to this molecule, this molecule connects to this molecule, this molecule connects, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you're just like, what is this? But when you actually, when they started to animate it and you got to see the process, uh, you saw things in a different way. Um, so yeah, I do want to add that that really made it click the, the stuff that you put on Reddit that made it, uh, where, where you can see like, like watching the, the central dogma of biology was, that was really cool. Like you said, it really does, you know, I mean, picture speaks a thousand words, but you know, the movie is, you know, like a million. It's crazy. Thank you. Uh, KL says, I was hoping for more nerd clubbing and bar hopping stories. Well, okay, so um, in, in the science community, we have these things called journal clubs, journal clubs, not nightclubs, journal clubs, where the nerds get together <clears throat> and bring a paper and they, they all discuss the paper and that's called a journal club. That's how nerds go clubbing. So sorry to disappoint you. Um, let's see, bar hopping stories. Uh, well, maybe if you go to a journal club, a nerd club, uh, you can impress the young ladies at the salad bar. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, 
<laughs> okay, yeah, so I didn't. I didn't get the opportunity to go to college. I have a bunch of stories, but I'd rather not share them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, I think that some of us like have stories that we would just really rather forget. <laughs> Uh, I have some casino stories, um, maybe another time. And we got, oh my goodness, Sandy Pigeon is here. He is our Lieutenant Commander Pigeon, uh, Doctor of Ministry Education in Apologetics. Welcome. He's the guy that's going to have some stories. And um, I decided he's he's going to come to a Tuesday show. We're going to talk about Christian tracts. Uh, we're just going to review them, and and I've been actually suggesting I I was about to suggest to him, so maybe this is news to him, that we could also make our tracks to distribute in the D.C. area, in into our own churches. Uh, so, uh, that being said, I think we're going to do even a little bit of a poetry reading. We're going to study. Uh, I'll probably spend a minute or two going through some Navy Seal songs. Um, like I uh, in and we're gonna read them and then analyze them just for fun. I mean, I've I've learned some phrases in some of what the Navy SEALs would sing when they're marching along the beach. They're they're singing uh, "Bullet Sponge Marines, Bullet Sponge Marines." So I don't, you know, this will be fun. So that'll be our guy with stories to tell. So that being said, I have a whole bunch of videos. And, and I, I thought, first, I think I'm going to show something just to start off the evening. Um, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't able to, to get this all cleaned up. Um, I have a, um, I have some snapshots from Dr. Dan Cardinal. So this is talking about, today's talk is about the difficulty of protein macroevolution and even some microevolutions. I don't know how far this will go. It might need a continuation. But I asked Dr. Dan, and I'll, let me share this. I don't know if you could see it. All right. I. This is me on um, Erica's channel, and I'll, I'll show the specific um, video in question when I zoom out. I said, <clears throat> creation myths, who's Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal. I said, uh, creationists will win more molecular biology arguments on proteins and eukaryotes, because he was bragging that molecular biology supports evolution, and I'm saying, no, you're not going to win this. So, I mean, I'm, you know, we're on generally good terms, but, you know, I was throwing the gauntlet down here. And so I begin my argument here. I said, do you think all major protein, proteins, I misspelled it, proteins originate from a single, from a single gene or protein? Okay, so I make a lot of typos if you haven't noticed. I don't know exactly why that is. Do, do you think all major proteins originate from a single gene or protein? No one I know believes that. In creation myths, who's Dr. Cardinal, Stern Cardinal, he says, Salvador Cordova, nah, why would anyone think that? And we had this exchange here on, you see where it is, the after show, um, Erica and Otangelo streamed live on December 23rd on Gutsick Gibbons' channel. And so the timestamp there was at about 37.28. And so there was, an, there was a uh, brief exchange where I was saying, we're, we were talking about that. CRISPR Cass weighed in and he said, why do you think that? I said, I don't think that. I don't believe that they all descended from one. I'm just pointing out that you guys don't believe it either. And you don't seem, you guys don't seem to realize that's causing a problem for you because it looks like the orchard, it, it looks very much like the orchard model of creation. So 
for those who are not familiar with the orchard model, the idea is that um, for creatures, there are created kinds like plants and animals, for example. They didn't descend from a common ancestor, plants and anim animals. Neither did bacteria. And if you use the young earth, young creation model, that the earth and life are less than 10,000 years old, then even evolutionists will say, well, yeah, this is pretty un unrealistic to think that uh, all life would descend from a common ancestor at that point. They would, have, they would require independent origins. So you have all these created kinds. And we see that also with major protein families. And I said, so you guys are admitting independent origin of major protein families. I said, <laughs> I said we're going to win this argument. You've just given away the store here that you're admitting independent origins, no common descent. And that's going to be the theme of today because the I'm going to try to show that you can't evolve one major protein into another. An individual from one major protein family, you can't evolve it into another. There's no macro evolution. And what my exchange with Dr. Dan and actually several of them, CRISPR-Cas, Speed of Sound, Immutable Destiny, Emo, and all of them uniformly, except for Erica was kind of surprised, have argued for independent origins of major protein families. That's problematic because then how do you have evolution? It's not, it's not gonna be gradual. One for abiogenesis, it sort of would just have to like <laughs> mysterious mechanisms that create the independent protein families. And then for existing organisms, like say the emergence of vertebrates, all sorts of proteins just have to come out of almost nowhere. Uh, at best, they take pieces of one protein here and a, another protein there and stitch it together. Technically, we're talking about genes. So Emery, do you have some thoughts on that before we go on and I just wanted to lay down what we're trying to do. No, go go ahead. I mean, if you if you don't want to say that there's no there's no common ancestor of, of all proteins, I mean, you're eventually going to get back to genes at some point, and then you've really got problems. So yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So when I say proteins, I mean the genes that code for proteins. I'm my my language is a little sloppy. Yeah, and, and then I mean, <laughs> if you if you're going to tell me that there's no common ancestor of all genes then gen genetic phylogenies become very problematic. Well, oh, then another one, Luca, atheist Luca Medugno also says protein orchard. So this is the way I like to argue creationism. And by the way, just some more self-promotion here. I can't help it because my channel's small and I need to try to promote it. Uh, I was recently elected by those people I was arguing with is the number one YouTube creationist. But one reason I, uh, you know, one reason I get along with them is I actually just, I'd really try to respect what they say. And if, if they're critical of me, I will listen and I'll say, you know, let me, let me look on that. I'm not going to jump in like we see in internet debates. They'll just try to make something up in the, in the middle of a debate. I'll say, I, I'm not, you know, let me think upon that. That's a good point. And then I do think upon it. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. If if they're right, I will thank them for correcting me. But this was really easy. If eight, if if these atheists and some of them, I don't know how many. Uh, you know, some of them are probably just agnostics. Um, and and even a theistic evolutionist and Joshua Swamidas agrees with this orchard model. You know, they may have different. I mean, I shouldn't say it's a creationist orchard model. It's whatever their evolutionist orchard model is, where major protein families um, have independent origins. And um, I'm just like, <laughs> you're giving away the store. I wanted to tell creationists, why don't you start here with your orchard model? Because they're practically giving you away. Um, if if they see this, they also see problems with macroevolution of proteins. And that's what I'm going to highlight with the videos today. So 
I think just for the basics to teach people just to review, um, and Sandy Pigeon has asked me to try to give a little bit more basics. I think the first video I will show is I'm going to try to show the central dogma of molecular biology. And it's a lot easier than you think. Um, I'm going to try this video out and then people in the chat and Andrew and one uh, Aaron here, one cow, feel free to uh, ask questions and we'll, I'll try to answer the question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer. <laughs> And if I can't answer, that's pretty bad because I'm, supposed to, I'm supposedly the molecular guy here. So, um, but we'll give it a, um, I'll give it a shot here. Let's see. Wait, I'm not going to, hang on. I learned the hard way not to do it with Windows uh, Media Player. It's better to do this with a Chrome tab. So let me open a Chrome tab here. And while Sal's doing that, guys, if you have questions, ping me in his image. Ping me. That way Sal doesn't have to worry about it. Um, so the, I'll, I'll just watch the chat for questions, and Sal can worry about playing the videos, and we won't have to try to re-chat and play the videos and talk at the same time. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Yes, um, so tag, uh, do an at in his image. And so I think, all right, I'm going to... Uh, Please let me know if the audio comes through. So this is protein synthesis, but this is this is what they call the central dogma. Uh, it's going to illustrate the central dogma of molecular biology. So even those of you who've not studied uh, biology formally or the all the prerequisite chemistry, you're going to get this real fast uh, because the animation actually makes it very clear. Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called a nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. Praise God for the works he has done. <clears throat> 
So um, again, this is what I'm trying to also say. Um, we're in such fight mode of like, let's destroy the evolutionist and the abiogenesis people. We forget this is also for our encouragement. Um, when I am despairing, I think of the cell, the lilies of the valley, how they grow. And I see God's power and wisdom when I see this. So going back mechanically, the, the DNA is like a blueprint and then it makes a protein. It goes through an intermediate kind of blueprint called the RNA. <clears throat> so are there any questions here, guys? Um, so there's not, not com anything come in, Sal, so, so far so good. Okay, so, so this, you know, there's a lot of chemical details there, but essentially it's just showing how the DNA is a, is a blueprint for the proteins. Now, <clears throat> it's not exactly correct to say that DNA is the blueprint for life. We're finding that out. Um, that's a whole nother story. It's the, it is a blueprint for the proteins, but the proteins are only part of the story anyway. And there's probably more, especially in multicellular organisms like human beings, um, there's definitely um, other places where blueprints are stored. And that's a whole nother story, but I just wanted to throw that in. So let me now show a what one of the proteins, I think one of my favorites is the potassium ion channel. So let me get that ready. <clears throat> and this one, It, this one, the potassium ion channel, it's a, what they call, actually, let me, let me do one on transmembrane proteins. Let me see if this one is uh, membrane proteins. So they're all, um, <clears throat> the cell has lots of membranes, including the, um, the entire exterior of the cell. It's, it's a membrane. And so I'm going to do a video on membrane proteins. Let's see. Let get... Membrane proteins are those proteins that are... All right. So I, I thank everyone for their forbearance. Uh, studying God's works, <laughs> studying God's work works can be tedious, but I hope you will be edified in the process. So let me share this. Let's see, membrane proteins. Membrane proteins are those proteins that are either a part of or interact with biological membranes. They make up around one third of human proteins and give different kinds of membranes their unique properties. They help with both facilitated diffusion and active transport, connect cells together, participate in signal transduction, and act as markers for cell identification. Proteins are what carry out most of the specific functions of membranes, so the amount and types of proteins vary between different membranes. Membranes can be up to 75% protein by mass. Membrane proteins come in two flavors, integral or intrinsic, and peripheral or extrinsic. Integral membrane proteins are a permanent part of the membrane, while peripheral proteins are only transiently associated with either the membrane or integral proteins where these associations are hydrophobic, electrostatic, or other non-covalent interactions. There are several different kinds of integral proteins. Integral monotopic proteins are attached to only one of the two leaflets of phospholipids making up the membrane, and they don't span across it. There are also transmembrane proteins and lipid-anchored proteins. Transmembrane proteins are those that span the lipid bilayer, and can be bitopic, spanning across the membrane once, or polytopic, spanning across it more than once. Lipid-anchored proteins are those which are covalently attached to lipids embedded in the lipid bilayer. For example, GPI, or glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol, is a glycolipid that gets attached to a protein C terminus during post-translational modification. It acts as an anchor for proteins to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. 
Both integral and peripheral proteins can be post-translationally modified. There can be addition of fatty acids, diacylglycerol, pranol chains, or GPI. Recall that cellular membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer, which consists of two leaflets of phospholipids. These phospholipids have polar heads which are hydrophilic, or water-loving, and nonpolar fatty acyl tails that are hydrophobic, or water-hating. Polar substances like to interact with other polar substances, and nonpolar substances hang out with other nonpolar substances. This really attests to the power of hydrogen bonding. Water molecules want to interact so badly with their polar buddies that anything nonpolar getting in the way of their hydrogen bonding results in decreased entropy. The result is what's called the hydrophobic effect. This is why phospholipids in water will spontaneously form lipid bilayers. These bilayers minimize contact between polar and nonpolar molecules, maximize hydrogen bonding, and maximize entropy. This is also why transmembrane proteins are amphipathic, which means that they have regions which are hydrophilic and regions which are hydrophobic. The hydrophilic regions are exposed to water on either side of the membrane, while the hydrophobic bits are happily interacting with the hydrophobic tails of lipid molecules in the interior of the bilayer. As a result, transmembrane proteins are stuck permanently in the cell membrane and are very hard to isolate. To get them out, you need to add detergent which is amphipathic and will disrupt the lipid bilayer. There are two basic types of transmembrane proteins, alpha helical proteins and beta barrel proteins. Note that while helix bundle proteins are found in all types of biological membranes, beta barrel proteins are only found in the outer membranes of gram-negative bacteria, mitochondria, and chloroplasts, evidence that contributes to the endosymbiotic theory in which eukaryotic cells acquired these organelles through the ingestion of prokaryotes. Transmembrane protein structure can be predicted using a hydropathy plot, which has hydrophobicity index on the y-axis and amino acid number on the x-axis. The amino acids making up a protein are localized according to polarity within its final structure in such a way that the polar amino acids face the outside aqueous solutions and the nonpolar amino acids are adjacent to the lipid bilayer. Transmembrane proteins can be classified by topology, which is based on the position of N and C termini as well as start transfer and stop transfer sequences. For example, type 1 is a single transmembrane pass with the N terminus on the extracellular side of the membrane. Type 2 is also a single transmembrane pass, but the N terminus is on the cytosolic side of the membrane. How these different topologies come about will be the topic of another video. Often, transmembrane proteins function as gateways, allowing specific substances to pass across the membrane. They can undergo conformational changes as they do this. They might participate in facilitated or active transport. Facilitated transport is spontaneous passive transport of substances via transmembrane proteins. Active transport, however, requires energy. Active transport may be necessary, for instance, if a substance is being carried across the membrane against its chemical or electrical gradient. As a final note, in animal cells, most transmembrane proteins are glycosylated. These sugar residues are always present on the non-cytosolic leaflet of the membrane. As a result, the cell surface is covered in carbohydrates, which form what's called the cell coat. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. You can also support me by following the link to my Patreon. If you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment. <clears throat>
and especially this year, I've been reading through the Psalms. It says, I will declare the works of God and praise God for the things he has done. Um, I've gotten some feedback and people watching the video said, this looks so, it puts them in a worshipful mood. And I'm like, yeah, it's supposed to. Biology was designed to give us thoughts of our creator and that we would wonder and glorify him. Prior to Darwin, this is actually in the PBS um, evolution series. They said before Darwin, biology, uh, the biological world was viewed as all these creatures as designed to make men wonder at their creator. So um, I'm trying to get us out of the mode of let's just always fight the Evos. I'm trying to get us in a mode of let this inspire us to worship the creator. Because uh, if you do look around the world, it does look pretty sad. And uh, we can lose sight of, of, of God's power. And, and so when I was sitting in biochemistry class, I just, <laughs> every chapter or so, I just wanted to stand up and praise God. So let us worship the Lord as we see his marvelous works. Any comments, Man. gentlemen? I, I don't think I have any. I'm sorry, man. Other than wow? Wow. Yeah. Okay. So why did I show the transmembrane proteins? We have all these families of proteins. So many families. And each of, and each of those families is essential. When James Tour gave his talk, he said, uh, you'd be dead without transmembrane proteins. And he was specifically criticizing a Nobel Prize winner by the name of Jack Shostak. Hmm. And everyone was crowing around the internet. Look, we've solved the origin of life problem. We found that uh, fo uh, that phospholipid spontaneously formed lipid bilayers. Unbelievable. And James Tour rightly pointed out in around the same time, Change Tan and Rob Stadler, Change Tan and Rob Stadler. And, and Rob has a way with words. He said, you basically created a tomb if you don't have transmembrane proteins. Nothing's going to live because nothing can get in and out. You've built a coffin. And Dave Farina said that in his debate with <clears throat> Kent Hoven. Kent Hoven's not the, <clears throat> doesn't have the technical depth of James Tour. Actually, for that matter, hardly anyone on the planet has the technical depth of James. Yeah, that's not a knock on anybody. <clears throat> you don't have Tor's technical depth. <laughs> um, but Ross Stadler pointed out, and James Tour using different sets of words, you basically built a coffin. That's nothing to be advertising to the world that you're solving the origin of life problem, that you built a coffin that life can't possibly evolve because you need the transmembrane proteins. So the video that I showed <clears throat> is kind of describing what, transmembrane proteins are. And I'm going to show a transmembrane protein, a specific one. So <clears throat> the thumbnail for our, for this video had the picture of a nut. Um, that's actually one transmembrane protein, a, a, a particular section of it. Now I had to modify the image just to make it look a little bit more like a square nut, but it does have square symmetry. It's beautiful. Um, we call it a, 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 a tetrameric. It's it's a tetramer, and it has uh, it has square symmetry. Tet tetramer meaning four pieces. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to show. Let me see. Um, first off, just the thumbnail. I, I modified the image. You'll see the. I'm, I'm going to show the original image here briefly. And this is actually a, I think, either a top-down or bottom-up view of the potass of a of an ion channel. I don't know specifically if it's a, a potassium ion channel or not, but it is a transmembrane protein. So if we think of the gate here, in the middle, it'll only allow certain things to pass. This is a very special gate, even though it looks like a hole, and it the, the, it will allow anything to go through. It's only going to let a specific 
ion go through. And all I did is I kind of blacked out these little pieces here. And if you do that, you'll get that that uh, thing that looks like a, a square nut. Um, so that was the thumbnail. So you see it there. That that is um, uh, <clears throat> that is a rendering of the ion channel in what they call a Richardson ribbon format. Um, we don't need to go there, but there's protein biologists like to look at the molecules using this kind of rendering. So that being said, let me try to bring up, um, where's the potassium ion channel? Uh, I think... Okay, so a potassium ion channel is one of the transmembrane proteins. It is a gatekeeper, and this is only one. And then I'll, um, I'm getting to the point. So um, it's like people are wondering, well, what are you doing? We're going to talk about macroevolution. I'm trying to um, just kind of spool people up on what proteins are. Then you'll understand why there's difficulty in macroevolution. So we've we've covered like three years of biology here, guys, in like 10 <laughs> maybe less than half an hour. So uh, this is definitely a crash course, but uh, I hope you're entertained with the wild ride here. So, let me try to get the Chrome tab going. Thank you all for your forbearance as I set this up. The bacterial potassium channel is a multi-pass transmembrane protein in the plasma membrane. It is built from four identical subunits that are arranged symmetrically. A pore in the center of the protein allows selective passage of potassium ions across the membrane. Four rigid protein loops, one contributed by each subunit, form a selectivity filter at the narrowest part of the pore. This structure is responsible for the channel's high degree of selectivity for potassium ions over sodium ions. In the selectivity filter, carbonyl groups line the walls of the pore. These carbonyl groups are spaced precisely to interact with an unsolvated potassium ion, balancing the energy required to remove its hydration shell. Passage of a sodium ion through the channel is energetically unfavorable because the sodium is too small for optimal interaction with the carbonyl groups. So how does this relate to macroevolution of major protein families? Uh, I will, let's grant for the sake of argument, we can modify this potassium ion channel to do a few other things. But um, let, let me show if I could see if I could show this. I have, have a diagram here I'd like to share. Let's see if I have it. And so um, <clears throat> the first thing I'll do is I'll uh, I'll stop this share. I'll reshare and I'll share my screen. So in that um, <clears throat> in that potassium ion channel, it said that it had to have a perfect fit. So you have all these other ions that, and you can see the sizes there listed, 1.81 angstroms, 1.33 angstroms, 0.99 angstroms, 0.96. That channel had to be engineered so that it will allow only 
this. There's not a lot of play. Anyone that knows what an angstrom is, this is like um, sub wavelength of light distance. This is almost subatomic sizes in terms. And anyone who's worked in the machine shop, you could probably say, oh, you know, we have precision up to microns or millimeters. This is like um, less than nanometers. This is on the nanometer scale. We can't mill things that precisely. So what does this have to do with macroevolution? Um, whatever way you modify this potassium ion channel, at least in terms of the size, it's like a it's like a bolt fitting through a nut. Uh, it, it, you don't have a lot of leeway. It's either going to get too loose or too tight. And what that means is the general idea is you're not going to improve it because it's already optimal. Natural selection. There's any change you make is at best going to be neutral in terms of the, the channel size. Uh, most likely it's going to compromise it. It's going to be bad. So the, the idea that most mutations are deleterious, that's an example there for that, for the, for the parts of the protein that control the size of that channel, um, um, most of the changes can, as a matter of principle, cannot be an improvement. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's, so we're not going to be able to change this. You know, you may add on some things just for the sake of argument, like say giving it what they call voltage gating and then receptor um, you know, receptor-based gating and so forth. But in terms of the channel itself, it's not, you can't make it something else. This is like um, evolving a, a, um, a nut into a bolt. It just doesn't make any geometric sense. So for those mechanically minded, just think about that. You don't, you might gradually change something, you know, conceptually in terms of uh, mechanical parts, like you might make it bigger or smaller. Um, but you don't really evolve a nut into a bolt. They're separate conceptual entities. And so <clears throat> that's one of the problems with the macroevolution. So as I show you more other proteins, you're going to see it really doesn't make sense that you're going to evolve a potassium channel into some of the other kinds of proteins that I'm going to show you. Um, are, are there any questions or comments? And maybe at this rate, I'm putting everyone to sleep and we're losing viewers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no comments yet. And we've held about, we've held steady at about 16, 17 viewers for the last, oh, I don't know, half hour or so. I know so, for me either. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Let's see. We, we've been going an hour and 50. Yeah. And <clears throat> an hour and 15 minutes and I'm only through like 15% um, of the videos I have on hand. So we're not gonna go through everything, all right? I'll spare you. But um, <clears throat> I did lay out the fact that Dr. Dan and company basically agree with this. So <clears throat> if, if we get anything as a takeaway it's that the other side is basically argued for independent origins. The problem it makes for them is like, okay, if you're arguing for in independent origins, how does random mutation and natural selection build a new protein class? And so we, we saw some protein classes there. So um, I showed a transmembrane protein and I think I know I, this is gonna be, um, uh, the next video I think is going to be cool. I'm going to show you another protein class. So I showed the membrane proteins and then this potassium ion channel is one example of the membrane protein. What they didn't describe is how are the membrane proteins stitched into the membrane? It's not enough just to evolve a membrane protein. You need machines to stitch it into the membrane. And I'm going to look for something that will show that. Let me see if I could show transloc. Uh, I should have, yeah, protein translocation. 
Okay, I have I have a video for this. If you'll forbear with me as I as I load it. And Emery, I know you're not a uh, you're more of the organismal. I hope you're still enjoying this. I'm fine, Sal. Like I, I'm not as nerdy as y'all are. <laughs> um, but like at least when it comes to this, but like it's interesting. It's very interesting. Although I will say, Sal, like you're you're talking about worshiping in biochem class. I was I was praying. I wasn't worshiping. <laughs> Yes, I was worshiping in the biochem class. I really was. And I was praying for, for <laughs> <laughs> enough grace to pass. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't do that in most biology classes, but it did in that class. <laughs> oh, boy. <sighs> so let me share. Let me share this. Okay, so we talked about transmembrane proteins, but they have to there there has to be machines, there has to be a process that stitches it into the membrane. And you also need proteins that are part of those machines. So let me share that. The term secretion is used to describe the movement of a protein out of the cytoplasm. A gram-negative cell has a number of destinations for secreted proteins. Secretion systems move proteins into the inner membrane, the paraplasm, the outer membrane, or outside the cell into the surrounding environment. Special export systems are required to move hydrophilic proteins through the hydrophobic membrane barriers. Let's examine how proteins are delivered to the inner membrane. As a ribosome translates a protein destined for the inner membrane, the first part of the protein to emerge from the ribosome tunnel is a very hydrophobic region called a signal sequence. A cytoplasmic structure called a signal recognition particle, or SRP, quickly binds to the signal sequence. SRP, which is a complex of RNA and protein, essentially paralyzes the ribosome. SRP delivers the stalled ribosome and its nascent protein to the cell membrane, where SRP binds to a membrane protein called FTSY. Although some proteins spontaneously insert into the membrane, most use a general secretion complex composed of three proteins, collectively called the SEC-YEG translocon, embedded in the cell membrane. In this process, SRP dissociates from the complex prompting FTSY to deliver the signal sequence to the translocon. The newly made membrane protein may have many membrane-spanning regions. These hydrophobic regions, 20 to 25 amino acids in length, are important because they're compatible with the hydrophobicity of the membrane itself. The hydrophobic regions move laterally out of the complex and into the membrane. The looping may occur many times considering that many transmembrane proteins have as many as 12 such membrane-spanning regions, which weave back and forth across the membrane. In proteins have as many as 12 such membrane-spanning regions, which weave back and forth across the membrane. Okay, I'm going to just pause it here just to make some commentary. So we saw the potassium ion channel earlier and how, how it works. Well, this is describing how that potassium ion channel is constructed in the cell membrane. And so there, there needs to be machines. So the problem is some of the representations are very cartoonish. It's, it's very kind of hard to, to see this. So um, we have all these other pieces here that are other proteins that are needed to make this. So just like in a factory, you have all sorts of parts to make other parts. And um, they have to have unique shapes. If you alter the shape, it's gonna fail to be a, a functioning part. It's very hard to micro-evolve something uh, into something else. And like I said, 
The other side is basically giving this away. They're admitting you have to have independent origins. The only thing that's not uh, really resolved at this stage is what are the actual uh, major families uh, that we would say would require independent origins? It's kind of like it is a different form of baromenology. What are the created kinds of proteins? Um, I'm, not, I'm not even touching that. You know, it's like, okay, the kinds exist. I'm not going to define each and every little kind. We could say the major groups, the kinds would fall into these major groups. And we know that they would exist as a matter of principle. And it's not too far from what the evolutionists are arguing, that they're independent origins anyway. So this is where the creation model actually aligns with the opposite. I'm just like, I don't think the creationists are aware of this. They focus so much on organismal baromenology, which you know I'm not really involved in. Uh, people are not looking at this level of created kind, so to speak. These are architectures. And, and uh, so are there any questions or comments? We're now down to 15 viewers. <laughs> But We're I praise team for a while, so like you yeah. know, it's it's fluctuating a little bit. But um, well, well, I expect this to happen. This, uh, it, you know, even I fell asleep in uh, biochemistry class, and I have to admit this: even some of the videos I made on chemistry, I fell asleep watch rewatching my own videos. Okay, so I don't take offense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take it off topic too much, but. How do they, how do they discover these things? This the, these things have to be occurring at just blindingly fast speeds because cells divide in you know matters of minutes, and there's thousands of these things across you know different parts of every cell. I mean, I, I, I th first off, it's pretty obvious this is it has to be brutally difficult to do these experiments, and I think they do it um, in vitro where they take pieces of it. They can't, they try not, a lot of the experiments don't do this with whole cells, which is admittedly a problem because you don't know whether your experimental setup is doing something to compromise the actual behavior. Um, so I think that's how they, they will isolate an FTSY and, um, um, you know, they'll just uh, have kind of in the beak or just a few chemicals that they, they're trying to study I think that's generally how it's done. Um, specifically how it was done for this, I don't know. Um, and I'm sure probably some of the experiments were done, experiments had to be done in pieces, like where they're stalling the, the ribosome. Um, and then they would take maybe a piece of the FTSY and you know, signal recondition particle, because I think to have the whole cell there is gonna be pretty hard. That's, that's my guess. Um, it's partly, my guess is based on kind of like when I was in the biochem class, they did go over the experimental methods that they used to determine this and it's miserably difficult. You can imagine. <laughs> so I thank God that he has provided us an environment that we're studying this. Ironically, it's because we have disease in the world that we're very motivated to study it. We're extremely motivated to study it. So here, here, ex an example again of things that, um, you know, are definitely tragic in the world, but God can still use it to motivate us to, to, to discover his works because the medical industry is just making the creationist argument. So anyway, that actually is a good question. Because, I mean, did you have any skepticism whether this is accurate or not? Um, and that actually is a fair criticism. No, not really. I just know that, you know, that there's, I've read whole books just on just the process of discovering something. I think it was um, Stanley Prusner's sort of account of discovering prions. And it's, I mean, it was decades of his life just, you know formulating the you know the hypothesis and then and then he's literally had to execute like a two million dollar experiment over 
I think it was almost 10 years before he came to the conclusion and just made the virology community irate at him. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard one. That's for sure. At least from what I can tell. So, well, I'm going to cover a few more of the proteins and, um, uh, I may make, this is meant to be a nerd session, but it's, it's a little more accessible than I'm, <laughs> than my taste. <laughs> I want to get, I want to have one that's even a little bit more nerdy for, for, I mean, you know, for the, for the biochem types. Cause I really do want to reach out to, to, to them. Um, but I'm really glad, you know, I tried to, I'm trying to make this as accessible as possible. And I, I know some people's eyes will roll over. Um, I'm going to, I could have another one on the translocation mechanism. Let me see if I have that one. This is also this is also protein. So we saw translocation, the incorporation of membranes for the bacteria. This one is in eukaryotes, and uh, this is a little bit more comprehensive. Endoplasmic reticulum. It, it, it uh, and so this does for the uh, for some of the membranes in the eukaryotes. It's a very similar principle. Uh, but I, I thought the animations were uh, pretty cool in this one. This is one that I've I've uh, uh, shown before, so happy to show it again. So let me see. All right. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER is the most extensive membrane system in eukaryotic cells. Proteins transported to the Golgi apparatus, endosomes, lysosomes, and the cell surface all must first enter the ER from the cytosol. As an mRNA molecule is translated into a protein, many ribosomes bind to it, forming a polyribosome. There are two separate populations of polyribosomes in the cytosol that share the same pool of ribosomal subunits. Free ribosomes are unattached to any membrane. Membrane-bound ribosomes become riveted to the ER membrane and translate proteins that are translocated into the ER. These membrane-bound ribosomes coat the surface of the ER, creating regions called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Two kinds of proteins are moved from the cytosol to the ER. Water-soluble proteins completely cross the ER membrane and are released into the lumen while transmembrane proteins only partially cross the ER and become embedded in the membrane. All these proteins are directed to the ER by a signal sequence of small hydrophobic amino acids. The signal sequence is guided to the ER membrane with a signal recognition particle, or SRP, which binds the ER signal sequence in the new protein as it emerges from the ribosome. Protein synthesis then slows down until the SRP ribosome complex binds to an SRP receptor in the ER membrane. The SRP is then released, passing the ribosome to a protein translocation channel in the ER membrane. Thus, the SRP and SRP receptor function as molecular matchmakers, connecting ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins containing ER signal sequences to available ER translocation channels. In addition to directing proteins to the ER, the signal sequence functions to open the translocation channel. The signal peptide remains bound to the channel, while the rest of the protein chain is threaded through the membrane as a large loop. Once the protein has passed through the membrane, it is released into the ER lumen. After the signal sequence has been cleaved off by a signal peptidase located on the luminal side of the ER membrane. The signal peptide is then released from the translocation channel into the membrane and rapidly degraded. It is thought that a protein serving as a plug then binds from the ER lumen to close the inactive channel. But not all proteins that enter the ER are released into the ER lumen. Some remain embedded in the ER membrane as transmembrane proteins. For clarity's sake, the membrane-bound ribosome will be omitted to illustrate the translocation of transmembrane proteins into the ER membrane. In the simplest case, that of a transmembrane protein with a single membrane-spanning segment, the N-terminal signal sequence initiates translocation, just as for a soluble protein, but the transfer process is halted by an additional sequence of hydrophobic amino acids, a stop transfer sequence, 
further in the polypeptide chain. The stop transfer sequence is released laterally from the translocation channel and drifts into the plane of the lipid bilayer, where it forms a membrane-spanning segment that anchors the protein in the membrane. As a result, the translocated protein ends up as a transmembrane protein inserted in the membrane with a defined orientation. In some transmembrane proteins, an internal signal sequence is used to start the protein transfer, which continues until a stop transfer sequence is reached. The two hydrophobic sequences are then released into the bilayer where they remain anchored. In complex multipass proteins, in which many hydrophobic regions span the bilayer, additional pairs of stop and start sequences come into play. One sequence reinitiates translocation further down the polypeptide chain, and the other stops translocation and causes polypeptide release, and so on, for subsequent starts and stops. Thus, multipass membrane proteins are stitched into the lipid bilayer as they are being synthesized by a mechanism resembling a sewing machine. Yes, by a mechanism resembling a sewing machine. Yeah, I was going to ask if I heard that right. I'm like, we have a molecular sewing, sewing machine. machine. <laughs> and you can see all the other proteins there. Um, just briefly, because uh, this could get really tedious. These, um, you see these red and orange segments? That's one problem with microevolution. If you change these sequences here, this falls apart. And if you also want to make this molecular stitching, you have to evolve those segments. So I'm, I'm kind of teaching. The reason I like these animations, I'm tr trying to show how we arrive at these protein probabilities. These are essentially passwords here to say, OK, well, that's also a good word because for it to pass through the membrane, you need a certain sequence. It's like a password, literally. And, and one passes this way and the other passes the other way. There has to be an orientation. And so micro, even there's challenges in microevolution of this. You know, we were talking about all the big structures, but even with the microevolution of some of these segments here, and these are each about uh, 22, 25 amino acids. And if you have multi-passes, it's, it starts to add up the, the difficulty of constructing some of these transmembrane proteins. And we saw an example of a transmembrane protein with a potassium ion channel. So I'm glad I showed this just to show the sewing machine. Isn't that totally cool? <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. That is amazing. So there's that image you had there. It showed the, um, that's a lipid, it's a phospholipid bilayer, the gray right here. horizontal line. Right. So this is the cyto this is the cytoplasm in a eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell. Okay. The eukaryotic cell has lots of inner membranes, and I think this is a, this is a, um, one of the uh, organelles. They're talking about like the Golgi apparatus and some other things. And so it needs transmembrane proteins through the organelles. Speaking of which, that's why eukaryotic evolution is so difficult. You end up having to have all these organelles that need transmembrane proteins plus the stitching mechanism too. And I said, how did that evolve? And I was debating an evolutionist whom I call Mr. Leaky, leaking membranes. <laughs> I say, how did a eukaryote evolve? Because you have to solve these problems for all the membranes. And he said, it just leaks out, in and out. <laughs> so, of course, I, I wanted to say you need to familiarize yourself. You need to study your cellular biology a little bit more, buddy. So I, I, I refer to him as Mr. Leaky Membranes, <laughs> evolutionist. Any other comments, gentlemen? And um, I'll just show a couple more because this is getting tedious. But lest we forget, what's the goal of this? I will declare the works of God and I'll praise him for all his wonders. And that kind of gets me through this tedium. Uh, if we look at this, God's giving, God's telling us, um, I'm giving you tons of data and it's going to be so much you can't consume it. It's going to be, and it's so beyond 
human understanding, it's burning your brains out just trying to understand it. So just that's what gets me through this tedium is I look at this, this, these are the works of God. And yes, it is taking a lot of energy out of us to appreciate it. But, you know, maybe in a calm moment when you've recovered, you're, you'll look, hopefully you'll look back and say, wow, wow. And I hope it puts into context the opening video when you saw the flowering plants. That beautiful expression in nature, it's made possible by all these molecular mechanisms. So we're seeing just how much is needed to, to, make, uh, to make this symphony play out, so to speak, how many instruments. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a few more. Uh, some of them you've seen before and these are gonna be my favorites. And, and these are modestly short the helicase protein. And so some people will say, well, Sal, you didn't get in, in, into more of the details. It's like, yeah, the, this is already painful enough. I could, but I'm gonna spare the viewers. Helicases. So I'm gonna show something you've probably seen me show before. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, this, <clears throat> uh, we wouldn't be um, alive without this particular pro <laughs> protein. Uh, for that matter, a lot of the proteins we've covered, we wouldn't be alive if we didn't have those. And we wouldn't see those beautiful flowering plants if we didn't have those. So uh, I'm about to show one of my favorites. Um, the helicase. And then one more after this. Helicases separate nucleic acid duplexes into their component strands using energy from ATP hydrolysis. <clears throat> the crystal structure of this DNA helicase from bacteriophage T7 reveals a hexagonal arrangement of six identical subunits. Surprisingly, the ring is not six-fold symmetric, but is slightly squished. A model for the <clears throat> mechanism of how the enzyme might work explains this structural asymmetry. Of the six potential ATP binding sites, two opposing ones bind ATP tightly, two are more likely to bind ADP and phosphate, and two are empty. These three states may interconvert in a coordinate fashion as ATP is hydrolyzed, creating a ripple effect that continuously runs around the ring. Because of these conformational changes, the loops that extend into the center hole of the ring that are proposed to bind DNA oscillate up and down as seen in this cross section. The oscillating <clears throat> loops might pull a DNA strand through the central hole, thus unwinding the double helix in the process. A frontal view shows the full dynamics of this fascinating protein machine. That's one of my favorites. Isn't that one of the coolest things? Um, let us praise God for his works and his marvelous works. And Dr. Carter is here, oh my goodness. Uh, that's the ER membrane shown, which can bud off and join the Golgi complex. That was from the prior video. From there, the membrane containing embedded proteins may be sent to the cell membrane or join the membrane organelle. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Everything that I show that is cool is only the tip of the iceberg. And uh, Dr. Carter just uh, added some more. So let us praise God for his marvelous works. And I'm gonna close with one that I talk about a lot. And um, just to review here, uh, I hope you can kind of see then that it's very, it's gonna be hard to evolve this helicase into a transmembrane protein or vice versa. Again, emphasizing the point, there's not gonna be macroevolution between major protein families. The only question is where are the actual boundaries? Uh, but people who study this will say, of course it's absurd. 
It's reinforcing the point the evolutionists have actually already conceded independent origins of major protein families. And it's like, okay, we, we got you now because you're going to have to justify then what's the mechanism of the independent origins? What's the mechanism of the independent origins? And so now um, that's the case I'm going to prosecute over this year. And just, I'm just kidding here, what I'm about to say. I'm fighting to maintain that number one spot as the number one YouTube creationist. And this is the argument I'm going to keep putting forward. I'm going to say, okay, so we're both in agreement, the creationist and, and evolutionist, that the major protein families have independent origins. So now the, or, the evolutionists need to justify then what mechanism they're going to invoke for the independent origins. For abiogenesis, we know that uh, you know, they're just going to punt and say, well, that's abiogenesis. It's like, fair enough. Now we can go to other proteins that would be, be considered post-abiogenesis. And one of them, we can, it'd be interesting to, to see which ones we come up with that we would call post-abiogenesis um, independent origins, because that would mean some of these major protein families sort of just kind of poofed out of nowhere. We may call them taxonomically restricted or orphans, but whatever we call it, it's going to be a problem. And to that end, I, I do want to have a discussion with some of the other side to tell me about their terminologies. Like they have these apomorphies and homomorphies and synapomorphies. For these proteins, I'm going to call them poofomorphies because they just sort of have to poof out of nowhere. And I, I wanted to say uh, you can either try to define creatures by your phylogenetic methods, I, I, I'd say um, they could also be defined in terms of these poofomorphies. <laughs> anyway, um, maybe one last protein. Gentlemen, um, it's, it has been a joy to, to share and declare God's work uh, with you all from the molecular level. And um, I think maybe the way I'll end the show is just going to show that video uh, again, of the uh, waltzing flowers, because I I, I want to zoom out and just kind of um, go away from the tedium, the molecular stuff. Do you, do you, do you gentlemen have any uh, comments or questions? Anyone in the chat? I I do not. Um, you got the only question I saw in the chat. Uh, you got those off that uh, sequencer, um, but uh, you know it's a very good. Uh, very good presentation, Sal. I won't pretend I understood all of it, but it was a very good presentation. Um, for what it's worth, I didn't understand all of it either. I would have to rewatch this. And, and uh, that's a very good comment, actually. What I want people to see is that even if you go to biochemistry class, I can guarantee what the professor says and what's in your textbook, you probably don't remember 90% of it because there's so many terms thrown at you and you have all these chemical names and these parts. But the nice thing about the animation is you get, you get the overall complexity of the system and you see the beauty of God. I would say taking biochemistry in the old days, I don't have access to some of the older books, but without those animations, I can imagine that the, it'd be, the experience would be kind of revolting. <laughs> Unless you have that. I'm sorry. Kinda. <laughs> but seeing those animations, I'm glad some people here are actually seeing the wonder of it all. Like that sewing machine, people can relate to that. And, uh, and like the helicase. Because if, if, if you ever read some of the, the papers, they're just really laborious because they're going into all the experiments and stuff. And I want people to look at this from the perspective of these are God's works. So I'm going to do two Topai Sunrise videos, and then that's going to be it. And um, we'll shut down the stream. I I am um, I'm thinking about having a live stream tomorrow just for to engage the critics or just have fun. I know they're having something on SFT's channel about some theological matter. So um, I, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do tomorrow night. I have a private apologetics meeting up until 9 o'clock or 
or so. So I probably won't even begin my my stream until 11 p.m. Just letting everyone know. I haven't figured out what that show is going to be. Um, some other administrative things next week is um, Sandy Pigeon and I doing Christian Review Tracks. And then on the 30th, tentatively, Rob Stadler and I will be doing a uh, the debate that never was. Uh, for some people that didn't know uh, the story, we were, um, John Maddox and I, were the original first team that were going to debate digital gnosis and James Fodor on, you know, his DNA evidence of God. And I said, let's, you know, I suggested um, a backup tag team, uh, James Carter and Rob Stadler being substitutes. And when I suggested those names, John Maddox said, oh, I'm going to step down because that ought to be the first team. And so it turned out the first team that was proposed then was not me and John Maddox, but me and Rob Stadler. When the other side heard, when the other side heard that that was our proposal, that the the first team would be Sal Cordova and John uh, Sal Cordova and Rob Stadler, uh, they backed down. <laughs> so uh, I said, Rob, since I ensnared you in all this mess, why don't you come on my channel? And he was going to do a three week preparation for the debate. He wanted to win this one. And I said, let's just just come on the channel. Just take it easy. Just share what's on your mind. We'll we'll just kind of go through what we might have laid out, kind of kind of a more relaxed, more friendly environment. So that's happening next Friday night. Um, we haven't set a specific time. I need to work that out with him, but uh, I presume it'd be around nine or ten o'clock, um, uh, unless Rob Stadler's uh, early bird. I'm going to move it up a little earlier. So. Oh. <laughs> oh wait, 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 wait. You know, the <laughs> never mind. Um Andrew Coffin, welcome back. And I'm I'm sharing the last two videos. Hi, so uh sorry I dropped out. My brother lives on a farm and we've had problems with foxes killing chickens. I had to chase one off, so I apologize for that. Hey, well, you know, uh, um, do you rate, does your brother raise chickens? Yes, he raises chickens. He's uh, trying to set up the hutch to where they can hatch them. And yeah, uh, it's mostly for the eggs. But yeah, I was chasing a fox around the yard. I apologize. Hey, that's actually, that's kind of cool, a fox hunt. Um, I had a, a, a quick joke for you, if you don't mind. Oh, please. Yeah, so. <clears throat> The uh, smartest uh, uh, evolutionary biologist went to God last week, and he said, you know what, God, we don't need you anymore. We got this all figured out. Uh, we can make a life in the laboratory. All we need is a little bit of dirt. And God looks at him and he said, go get your own dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I hope, I hope you guys would like that. So uh, two Tupai Samaris videos, and I'm going to close out with the, um, the uh, time-lapse photography of plants. So let us praise the Lord for the wonders that he has made. Let's see if I get this right. Let's see. Okay, many of you have seen this. And there's a reason that I show this. That is actually where a lot of my professional work has been in. And it is a really cool enzyme. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of fun. So let's, uh, let's roll. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil. It is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, 
you have to release the tension periodically. And one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. There are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix, and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing, but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double-stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling two twists at a time to yield a relaxed circle. Praise God for all his marvelous works. Amen. 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 Sal, can you just kind of really quick explain what would happen if that didn't take place? Um, our, uh, in, in creatures with modestly long genomes with double-stranded DNA, uh, it, it, you'd be dead. Um, so, so we have some kind of creatures like the bacteriophage that has single-stranded genomes and it's quote unquote genomes, a total mess. But um, so what's happening is like in the process of like, this looks like either replication or uh, transcription where the, uh, the single strands of DNA have to be separated apart. And so it coils up. So it's coiling up here like that. And um, it just, from what we know, uh, if you don't uncoil it, bad things happen. To that end, the reason topoisomerase is so well studied is what are chemotherapies? The principal chemotherapy attacks, it disrupts the function of top topoisomerase. So when we give cancer patients a, a chemotherapy that's based on disrupting topoisomerase, it's going there and disrupting how that topoisomerase does its thing, and it kills the cell. It kills a lot of cells, sadly, um, good cells as well as cancer cells. And, and the hope is you're able to get more of the cancer cells than the good cells. So that's, that's I think that's probably the most uh, poignant example of what happens if you don't have topoisomerase. And that's only one of the 20,000 proteins in the human, by the way. Uh, they specifically target, I, I'm pretty sure, topoisomerase 2, 2 alpha. Oh, the, it gets 2 alpha and 2 beta. Uh, I'm sorry. But we're trying to get it to target one of the isomers. But basically, um, when you saw that part where they're saying the topoisomerase 2, let's just play it again. So the topoisomerase 2 is really important there. So we'll start with this. Is one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing, but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double-stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling two twists at a time to yield a relaxed circle. I said, how does this evolve? If you have a topoisomerase that cuts and doesn't reconnect, that's bad. <laughs> You're going to mm -hmm. shred the entire genome. Yeah. Or if you have uh, something that does connecting without cutting, uh, it's going to be useless. Or if you cut and reconnect and don't pass the strands to untangle, it's also useless. Uh, go on, Emery. And I'd like a mechanistic explanation for how this evolved. Yeah. And I and I don't think you're going to come up with one. I really don't. And don't try to tell me that 
this is selection mediated because selection <laughs> doesn't work at the level at this level. It, it can't work at this level. It can't see what's going on at this level. No, it, no. And, uh, now uh, there is a CRS quarterly article written by Joe Deweese and I. Joe Deweese is a topo isomerase expert. Uh, he was published in Nature and he studied this professionally for like 20 years. Um, it was an honor to co-author an article with him and I only contributed maybe 10, 15% to the article. Um, a lot of it was, was him. But um, we actually had a good time. We were laughing at some of the mechanistic explanations and what were they? Phylogenetic reconstructions. The Color old, me shocked. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the phylogenetic reconstructions argued for independent origins of topoisomerases. <laughs> Wait, like, you would have evolved that more than once? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see, and I've been hammering. So this is another one I wanted to say. This is... I want to maintain that number one YouTube spot of number one creationist. I'm going to say this is another argument. You need to start dropping these. You need to start um, uh, recognizing phylogenetic reconstructions are not a are not a me mechanistic explanation in the way it needs to be explained. Whew. I just so one last, uh, I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> maybe to beat a dead horse, because uh, Topi Samrace is one of my favorites, I'm going to show one more Topi Samrace video, and then um, that'll be it. The The end of the stream yard will be just showing that video of the time lapse, which is just more for people's entertainment. But I'm going to show a different look at the Topi Samrace um, that was done with just uh, humans trying to animate with clay how it works. Uh, I thought the music in this one's a little bit obnoxious, but uh, just if you all can bear with it. Uh, Emery, I, I'm very appreciative you showed up because I know you're the organismal guy and um, I'm glad you can appreciate the Topo Isom race and um, th the barrier it poses. See, the more that we study, this is why I like talking about proteins so much because at the molecular level it's just like undisputable how hard some of this is to evolve uh practically impossible so that was the title of this uh youtube um of this particular stream so let me get this started and this is our last um video before i just finish the finish finish this out so praise god again for his marvelous works Let me know if you all uh, in the chat, if you can let me know if you're hearing the audio. I don't know that I set this up correctly.
So there you go, guys. Tepoi Sam races. There's a whole family of them, different ways to cut and untangle and reconnect. Um, let us praise the Lord for all of his marvelous works. And so with okay. that, um, I'm just going to close out the stream. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us. And um, it's uh, um, it, it's been encouraging that we haven't gone all the way down to like five people. The, the stream kind of recovered its numbers. And so now let's just zoom out. And uh, I, I opened this... Um, I, I opened this, uh, let me see if I have a time lapse. I, I opened this stream with this video and uh, it's just gonna be seven minutes long. It's just time-lapse photography, just purely for your visual entertainment. And if you like classical music, there's also classical music here. And um, I'm just leaving it here for your all's entertainment. So with that, before I say good night, um, I'll just go through the list here, Andrew, do you have any closing thoughts? Oh, I was just thinking that um, it's almost as if all these things were designed, right? <laughs> all these complicated uh, means in which to copy and and uh, cut apart and paste and all that <clears throat> in the gene. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for uh, having me on. And I really appreciate your channel. And I just want to encourage you to keep on. Thank you and God bless you, brother. One cow, Aaron. Man, I'm yeah. really glad. I'm glad to see you and Andrew. Thank you for joining. Oh man, my pleasure. No, this is. It just reminds me of you know God's ways are higher than our ways. Um, but I don't don't think it's inconsequential that you know humanity developed things like scissors and sewing machines just to have the analogy to understand what it is He did because it's. You know, it's cool to see the stuff that we can recognize. And then there's, you know, there's some things that you showed that there's just, I can't think of an analog. I can't think of something that, um, and I'm, I'm not like an engineer, so, you know, I'm sure there's stuff out there that, that operates the way some of these proteins do, but it's just really cool to see. And th thank you. And thank you for supporting me in my quest to teach uh, structural biology and to try to teach uh, God's wonders through geometry um, and visualizations. Emery? Um, I'm probably the only person here who's not really a structural guy. So like a lot of this stuff kind of went over my head. I'll just be honest, but I mean, like I can sit down and I can sit down and look at that top, how the topo summary functions and go, uh, -uh. <laughs> um, and it's a very, uh, you know, if, if you give me a function and a mechanistic thing, I'm, I'm okay. But like the structural stuff, it's like, okay, I, this is over my head. Um, but like the, the just, it's incredible how, I don't want to use the word complex, but I mean, I don't know what other word to use. It, this is very, this is very complicated, I guess. It's not, it is no, the, the, the Darwinian idea of a simple cell arising in a warm little pond somewhere is completely shot to ribbons. Yes. And by the way, I, after you're uh, done with this current semester, if you have time, I'm still interested in working on that butterfly problem. Um, uh, I've got those paper. I haven't had a chance to download the papers, but I've, I still have the links up on one of my 50 million tabs I have open. So, I, I will be getting those links for you. It's just a matter and, of me remembering. Yeah, we, well, we can talk about it um, because that's, um, you know, what I, I think the butterfly can make our arguments against natural selection more accessible. Plus, mm -hmm. they're just incredible, beautiful creatures. Um, I think we, we definitely can win the argument against the evos on st stuff like this and the abiogenesis mm -hmm. proponents. But yeah. You know, I'm trying to take it to another level and say, hey, guys, you know, we've already, you know, anyone except the very determined will see God's wonders. And yep. I'm trying to say, okay, we're going to alter this. My private apologetics group, I realized it's like, oh, after about 120 meetings, I realized we weren't meeting because we we're just trying to figure out ways to fight uh, atheists and non-Christians. 
we were beating because we were we were loving just the study of God's work. And after every meeting, we were always encouraged that we could see the works of the Creator and reassured us He is real. And when God's real in your life, when you pray, it's easier to believe that He hears you. So thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for our uh, all the viewers, especially the faithful ones that have shown up on uh, practically all of uh, the streams on this channel. And I'm going to finish with uh, <clears throat> um, time lapse photography of these um, of of these flowers that incorporate probably all the proteins that you saw studied today. And so, just enjoy. And I, I'd like to say, take care, and God bless you all. Have a good night. <laughs>